Welcome back to the For Second Nelson Show. I'm Josh Amishev. Today we're going to focus on online fraud and social engineering. Brett Johnson joins us, and he has an incredible backstory, but I'll let him share it with you. So my three main takeaways from our conversation were one, how criminals convince us to trust them online, two, bypassing company policies via social engineering, and three, how to get people to believe fake news and legends over facts. You'll enjoy those two things, plus a bunch of other tips along the way. Direct support for this podcast comes from BreachSense, the data breach monitoring platform. More details can be found at BreachSense.io. And now, here's my conversation with Brett. Brett Johnson, welcome to the show. Hey, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me on. So who are you and, and what do you do? <laughs> who am I? Well, that's that's kind of a loaded question, right? Um, I guess the, the best way to describe it is the United States Secret Service called me the original internet godfather. Yeah. So how did I get that title is the next question. And the answer is I was convicted of 39 felonies. I was placed on the United States most wanted list. I escaped from prison. But the big one is I built and ran the first organized cybercrime community. It was called Shadow Crew. It was a precursor to today's Darknet and Darknet markets laid the foundation for the way modern cybercrime channels operate today. And of course, of course, I went to prison for all of that. So I got out and uh, I was very fortunate. I was very fortunate. My, uh, my sister, my wife, and then finally the FBI, they gave me the opportunity to turn my life around. And I took it, and today I work as a cybersecurity, cybercrime, and identity theft expert. I speak across the planet, work with uh, companies big and small, consumer groups, everything else, to try to protect them against the type of person that I used to be. So, like I said, kind of a loaded question when you ask that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really pleased that you brought me on your show. I think you got a great show. And I, I guess we're going to talk more about social engineering today than anything, but what strikes me, I've spent a lot of time, you know, I spent seven and a half years in prison. And since I got out, I've um, spent a lot of time doing a lot of reflection. And part of that has been, how did I end up, you know, doing all these things that I did? Not only that, but how did I end up turning my life around? And what, what occurs to me, I, I committed my first crime when I was 10 years old. So my mom was a fraudster and she was a very abusive parent as well. And she used to leave me and my sister at home for you know, for days. And our, my first crime was shoplifting food with me and my sister. And, that, of course, that turns into uh, clothes and toys and everything else. But mom comes home and sees everything we've stolen. And she asked me where it came from. And I told her, we found it. She said, no, you didn't find that. She asked Denise. And that was my sister. Denise was nine. She asked Denise. And Denise was like, we stole it. And my mom looks at my sister and she's like, show me how you're doing that. And she, she joins us. And when I say she joins us, that's kind of a nice euphemism for she ran us as two little shoplifters. So we would go to stores and we would either distract the staff or we would steal the stuff ourselves. And it was my mom, my grandmother, me and my sister. And that's, that's the first time I really got involved into crime. And you know, talking about, uh, we had, before we started recording, you mentioned social engineering and it occurs to me that people like me, and it's not just me as a criminal, but a lot of cyber criminals out there are very good social engineers. You know, we've got this perception that cyber criminals are these upper tier computer hackers able to break into any type of system that they want to. But the truth is, is that those those types of attackers are there, but their numbers are really, really small. The truth is, is that 98, 99% of the criminals online are just very good social engineers. So how did they get to be a social engineer? Well, if you look at my life and the life of a lot of the more skilled criminals that are online, it turns out that you become a social engineer as a child because you have to survive. You have to be able to read those adults around you and be able to manipulate those adults around you. And then once you gain those skills, somewhere later on in life, you decide to use those skills you've acquired for survival, those social engineering skills, in order to victimize other people. And that's exactly what I did. That's exactly what a lot of these online criminals do today. So I wanted to focus in, like, uh, like I mentioned before, into social engineering. From from your perspective, what's what's the essence of of influence? So, the essence of influence. Let's let's talk about trust. All right, so because that's that's at the bottom line. That's how social engineering succeeds. 
I don't care if a criminal is trying to defraud an individual or if a criminal is trying to defraud a company. He has to get that potential victim to trust him. All right. So how do you do that? How, how does a criminal establish trust in an online environment? Because trust is the most important thing. It doesn't matter if you're a good guy. doesn't matter if you're a bad guy. The reason we're online shopping at Amazon is we trust that Amazon is going to send us those products. We trust that eBay is not going to send us some sort of counterfeit good, even though it happens. <laughs> we trust that it won't. All right. Criminals. Trust has to be there as well. I already spoke about trust among criminals. You have to trust your criminal associates. But it, it extends past that. A criminal has to get a system or a person, a potential victim, to trust them as well. So how does a criminal do that? I would say it's three things. It's technology, tools, and then finally social engineering. So technology, it's your cell phone, it's your laptop, it's your desktop computer. We inherently trust that technology which is given to us. We don't really understand it a lot of the time, but we trust it. We trust the news that comes across the line. That's the problem with fake news. We trust those news stories. We don't verify those news stories, but by God, we believe them. So that's that's a lot of these issues is that we trust the technology that's there. What we don't tend to understand is that criminals use a variety of tools to manipulate that trust. They use spoof phone calls, so you don't see which phone number they're calling from. You see the phone number of the actual account holder. They use proxy addresses, so instead of them showing up as being in Ghana or Egypt or someplace like that, they can make it appear that they're in New York or Florida or California. So they use these tools that, that manipulate the technology that we inherently trust. But here's the issue with that. Tools and technology only lay a base level of trust. Now, sometimes you can defraud people just on that base level of trust. That's the whole idea with a lot of these robocalls that circulate, right? We The number shows up, you've manipulated the technology where it shows that it's your bank, the IRS, something like that. You pick up and you've got an automated voice that immediately tries to engage you to go down and get $30,000 worth of gift cards. That's a base level though. And sometimes that numbers game works. For more skilled criminals, though, and I'm talking just on a personal level now, for more skilled criminals, technology and tools lays a base level of trust. At that point, then social engineering kicks in, and we see how good of a con man, how good of a liar the criminal is in order to manipulate you into giving up what? Information, access, data, or cash. It's always those one of those four things, or a couple of those four things that are there, all right? So that, that's what I would say social engineering does is depending on how good the criminal is at manipulation, at understanding the technology and human psychology, how good he is at establishing that, that trust with you. So if it's, and the same thing applies if you're trying to defraud a company, if you're committing credit card fraud, or you're just trying to install ransomware, you have to get that potential victim to trust you. So how do you do that? Well, credentials, stolen credentials are a form of a tool which gets the system to trust you or a, a, brow, a spoofed browser fingerprint, something along those lines gets you to trust them. Or, you know, and let's be honest, a lot of times it's not even that difficult. If you're looking at ransomware right now, it's about, it's about brute forcing those passwords that are on SMBs. That's 51% of everything right now. So it's not, a lot of the time, as you know, security is not rocket science. It's not the stuff we don't know about. It's the stuff we're not doing anything about. That's the issue a lot of these times. And that's that's what criminals take advantage of. It's not, I think, I think that's one of the big takeaways is it's not, cybercrime is not really sophisticated. The platform on which it operates is sophisticated, but the attackers are not. Yeah, it's really zero days. It's I think the Australian government just came out with a report. CrowdStrike also in the last this week came out with a report and it's all financial stuffing. It's the most it's common all. way. It's yeah. all. And it, so what does that mean? That means that you're the human is the failure. So we're back to social engineering. We're always back to social engineering. How do I get your credentials? I know that 80% of everyone out there, they use the same password and log in across multiple websites. It's easy enough to get those credentials. If you're looking at spear phishing, some estimates take spear phishing at 80% successful. Doesn't matter the amount of cybersecurity awareness training you've got. Doesn't matter where your position is in the company. It's still about 80% successful. And that's why, you know, Kaspersky says this, 92% of every single attack begins 
with a phishing attack. 92%. So if you're looking at something like that, it's like, well, it's, it's easy to figure out why you're looking at compromising the human. Don't worry about the tech. Why would I potentially spend years trying to brute force my way past an industrial proof firewall when the only thing I need to do is spend some time and spearfish somebody behind that firewall? Easy enough. Or drop, let's be honest, drop a thumb drive in a parking lot someplace. If you're if you're around the physical location, you've got the same access. I'm granted to you all of a sudden. I mean, that's that's the issue with this stuff. So yeah, it's it's um it's social engineering and and it's scary when you think about it that you know you can have the, the best tech, the best security in place, and at the end of the day, attackers are out there looking for just that easy human target, which they're more than likely going to find. Are there personality types that are easier or harder to, to manipulate? I don't think there are. I really don't. I mean, I, I've been asked recently <laughs> at a couple of conferences, have you ever been scammed, Brett? And the answer is yes. Yes. I, I don't think it really matters about the demographic, the education level, or anything else of that potential victim. I think that we are all susceptible to being scammed, to being socially engineered. Um, it, it just depends on the skill level of the social engineer. And, and what type of work are they wanting to put into actually getting information, access, data, or cash from you? Um, a lot of the time, what you have to understand is that, so motivations of crime, online crime, you've got status, you've got cash, you've got ideology. Most of the time it's cash. And if it's cash, if they're looking for cash, then it's going to be that lowest hanging fruit, unless... Unless you're one of these people on Facebook that advertise that you you're holding four thousand bitcoins, if you're holding that, then you're a you're a victim in the way, in the making is what you are. Hell, I might attack you myself if I find out about that. But most of the time, for cash, it's the lowest hanging fruit. So if you're if you're doing just the base necessities of what you need to do to protect your organization or yourself, that criminal will tend to to pick an easier target. If, however, you're being victimized. You're being looked at by a criminal because of status. So I'm, I'm working with a couple of uh, bigger companies later this year, giving, later this month, giving a couple of presentations. If you've got a brand that is well known worldwide and it's highly respected, would a criminal attack you because of status? Yes, because then he gets to go back to all of his criminal associates, of which some of these groups are millions of members large. He gets to go back and brag about it. No one else was able to do this but me. And as such, he gains the respect or the status among his criminal peers, which equates to being very powerful. If you're at the top of the heap in some of these criminal communities, you make a lot of money. So people do it for status, bragging rights. They do it for ideology. Do you have a brand or a company that terrorist, nation states, hacktivist, don't like. If you do, then you're in a lot of trouble because it's not lowest hanging fruit anymore. You've got a persistent criminal that's looking to victimize you, just you. And at that point, I, I've worked with a couple of companies that that have been hit because of ideology and really trying to get those attacks to stop can become very difficult, very difficult. So it's, it's important to understand why you're being attacked Understand the type of criminal or the type of attacker that's out there. Is it is it your common criminal? Is it nation state? Is it terrorist? Is it hacktivist? Is it script kiddies? I mean, who's attacking you? Why are they attacking you? What are they looking for? Design security around how you're going to be attacked. Because what happens is, depending on who you are or what you do, is how you will be victimized. It's it's not a one 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 all approach for a criminal. A criminal looks at a company or an individual and he says, okay, for, for an individual, does this person work as a CEO or do they work payroll? If they do, the way that I will victimize you differs than if you work food service. If you're a CEO or payroll, I'm going to try to maybe launch a business email compromise attack. If it's food service, well, I can't do a, B, a BEC, but I can set up new accounts in your name. I can do HELOC loan fraud, student loan fraud create uh, bank accounts, everything else, and, and defraud you like that. So the way that I will victimize you differs. Uh, if it's a company, does your company have data that I can 
breach into the company, steal the data, resell on the black market, or does it have data that the company has to have to operate? That will determine up until recently, <laughs> that will determine whether I, I install ransomware, lock everything down, or steal the data and resell. Of course, these days, criminals have finally figured out, hey, not only install ransomware, we'll steal the data too and sell it. So, you know, it, there's always these evolutions that go on. Yeah, let, let's talk a bit about uh, BEC, business and what compromise. What are the what common techniques do you see used to influence others in those type of attacks? So remember I said it's it's technology, tools, social engineering, all right? You're checking emails on these things. You're checking emails on your laptop. Are you going to notice a Unicode domain? So you trust the phone. You trust the laptop or your desktop computer. You trust that the emails that are coming across are, are, are the correct emails. But are you going to notice that someone has registered a Unicode domain where maybe the I in the email address, so I, I own anglerfish.com. Are they going to notice if they're checking an email that the I in anglerfish.com doesn't have a dot above it on this? No, they're not. Are they going to notice it if they're in payroll and they're going through two to 300 emails a day? Are they going to notice that one of the emails doesn't have a dot above an I? No, they're not. So if you're looking at business email compromise, start over at LinkedIn, find you a target that works in payroll. Gather all the information you can on them. Find out who it is, where they work, pull the background check or the Delve point or the TLO. So you've got all the background check on that. Spend some time gathering all the data that you can on that, that potential payroll target. All right. Then you're going to spear fish them, get their credentials. So you can log into their email and start reading their email. You're not going to do anything yet. You're just going to spend some time reading the email. And you're going to look for that CEO or some relationship that's having money sent out from payroll. You're going to look for that. And you're going to figure out what the relationship, get the language done correct, everything else. Once that's done, you're going to create a Unicode domain in the name of whatever that, say it's the CEO of the company. So it's going to be the Unicode domain and the email address is going to be that person at that Unicode. You're going to go back into the payroll's email. You're going to block the real person. You're going to substitute the contact details for the Unicode email address. And you're going to send out an email. Hey, I need this done over here. I need this money deposited on this new, ad new address all of a sudden. So that's very effective to do that. Of course, what we're going to see, and again, it's, it's, it goes back to that technology tools, finally social engineering. So you've gathered enough. You, you, you've, you're manipulating the technology by using the tools. The tools are the Unicode domain. It's also the information that you've gathered on all the targets that are there as and, and the relationship of those targets. All that's a tool, and then it's put together for a social engineering attack in the form of that email that's being sent to say, hey, I need the deposit sent over here instead of where it's been historically sent. So that's a social engineering attack that takes place. Of course, what's interesting, and it's not, I mean, it's happened in a couple of instances and we're going to continue to see that that type of rise. But these deep fake videos, you know, now you've got real time deep fakes that are out and everything. So imagine that that CEO doing a FaceTime with the head of payroll and he's on there. Let's FaceTime, send the money over here all of a sudden. That's pretty powerful when you think about it. And I, I think we're going to see more of that right there. And, I, and we talk about SIM swaps, too, or anything else you want to. But at the end of the day. It's about the technology, the tools that manipulate that technology, and then that lays enough trust to come in with social engineering and see how good of a con man you are to get someone to do what you want them to do. Yeah, the uh, deep fakes is the quite scary once that becomes weaponized. I mean, it is. I mean, it's fun to watch. You've got that guy on uh, on YouTube that does the what's the sassy justice or whatever. That's a fun show, but you're looking at it and you're like, you know. That could be really dangerous too. <laughs> so, you know, you got Elon. Elon's a big guy on on Baby Doge now. So you got to you do a deep fake video of Elon Musk, whatever coin and what you want to do, and all of a sudden you're making a lot of money, or you've you've got some CEO of a company that comes out like well, like today with uh, the Litecoin stuff with Walmart. You know, a fake Walmart press release was put out saying they were going to accept Litecoin. Litecoin pumps up like 30% until they find out that it's a fake release. 
And then, of course, it crashes again. But you're, I think we're going to see that with these deep fake videos. You know, these these people coming out and it being released to the press. So you've got some figurehead actually saying it. Pumps things up. People steal a lot of money. Then they find out it's fake. Crashes down. Or even worse, you've got, you know, we had a lot of racial strife last year in the United States. So you've got that potential assailant that's got a gun in his hand. Law enforcement shoot him. Of course, it's removed using the gun is removed from the, from the assailant's hand. The video is put out has law enforcement shooting an unarmed man. Everything go explodes at that point. Of course, law enforcement is going to put out the correct video, but the damage is done by that point in time. So I think that at the end of the day, deep fakes are going to be extremely, extremely dangerous, both voice wise and video wise. And it's, it's, uh, we're really moving into, into an era of technology that we're not going to be able to trust our eyes, our ears, or anything else. It's, it's going to be extremely interesting and pretty dangerous, I think. So you have any suggestions how we can get better at spotting scams or attempts at persuasion? Yeah, I think that uh, for, for scams, understand again what I said. It's, it's, it's understanding that technology tools and social engineering is what lays that trust for a criminal. But in order for that crime to succeed... If it's against a person, it's all about getting that person to act out of logic, to get rid of reason and act emotionally is what it is. So if you're if you're on the phone with somebody, if you have a knock at the door, anything that's unsolicited, anything that's unsolicited, don't respond to. If you're on the phone and you know, you've got the IRS that's threatening to arrest you or the FBI or whatever, the best thing you can do is hang up and call them back. A lot of the times those phone numbers are spoofed. The, the scammer's not wanting you to hang up because you can't call them back. And if you call the actual you know, FBI, they're going to tell you, no, that's not right. So it's, it's about hanging up. It's about, and what that does, it, it allows you to take a pause, to simply sit there for a second and say, does this sound correct? In order to, to start thinking logically again, in order for the emotions to die down enough so that you're thinking logically. So that, that's with, with people, with, with companies, it's, you know, I said that training with spear fishing is not really successful, and it's not. But if you're training for the way a criminal will attack you, I think that's the important thing. So there's a difference between training for compliance and effectiveness. A criminal doesn't give a damn about HIPAA, GDPR, or California's security practices over there. They don't care about that because they're going to steal everything. So, but that doesn't mean you don't train for compliance. I mean, at the end of the day, at the, at the, at the least compliance allows you to say, Hey, I did something. So, but train for the way a criminal will attack you is, is I think one of the really big takeaways there. I worked for a, uh, when I first got started, the first, uh, the first client that I had was a fortune 50 company brought me in. We did a, a fishing simulation campaign while I was there. They sent out an email saying, we've added two more days of vacation time to the calendar. Of course, it didn't mention what the vacation days were. Instead, bottom of the email, it had a PDF labeled calendar. And the question was, I wonder how many people will click on that. The answer was, everyone clicked on that. So the problem was, the people who clicked on it, they got mad. I mean, they got mad and they started to complain. Well, this Fortune 50 company, their response was, is they sent out an email apologizing for what happened and basically saying, hey, we'll not do this again. That is the wrong thing to do because that is exactly how a criminal will attack you. And it's important that your employees know what those attacks are going to look like. So, you know, stage those incidents, work through through those incidents. It's the same thing with a uh, incident response plan. A lot of people, a lot of companies have a, a literal book on a shelf that they're supposed to pull off in case anything happens, but they never test anything. They just pull it off and then they find out as they're running through the pages, okay, we don't need this. We don't need this. Why is this even here? What are they talking about here? And they've never tested these plans before. So run through tests. That's one of the big things with, uh, with ransomware. You know, a lot of companies, <laughs> so, Funny story, got nothing to do with social engineering, but you got a lot of these companies that they, they've done the backups correct, right? So the backups up in the cloud someplace, they get hit with, social, with, with ransomware and they're sitting there thinking, oh, we're fine. Everything's backed up. 
until they start to reinstall the backups. And they've got maybe 49 petabytes of data and they figure out, okay, 49 petabytes across that wire is going to take about 69 years to reinstall. <laughs> so it becomes a problem. But even with, with ransomware, you're going to have the double extortion. So even if you have a backup. Exactly. You've got that too now. So it's like, oh my God. But, uh, you know, training is important. It's important to... Uh... We say training is important, but I would say adding technical safeguards that Absolutely. prevent people from making stupid mistakes. Absolutely. Well, I mean, that's that's the thing. If you're looking at retail fraud, it, it's all about the fraudster getting some customer service agent to act outside of policy. So a lot of the times policies and procedures are in place and you're trying to convince that human to not follow pro- policies and procedures. And a lot of the time it works. So you have, you're, you're absolutely right. You have to have these mechanisms in place that prevent that human from screwing up. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> humans will right. always fail. So if you can put absolutely. something in place that absolutely. humans, they can't bypass it. Absolutely. And that's, yeah. uh, you know, I'm giving, a, I'm giving a presentation tomorrow. And that's one of the things we're talking about is, is the, human, the human errors that, that go on. But the human errors extend, we talked about that earlier, it, they extend to the technology. You know, you're not changing those credentials. You're not blocking those outward facing SMBs. You're not, you're not doing the things that you need to do that we've known about for a decade or longer. And it's not even the SMBs. You can no. reuse credentials, port 80, 443. I mean, let's say 443, which should be open. You're still, <laughs> and most companies don't have an accurate attack service map. They don't even know what they own. No, no, they don't even know what they own. Here's, here's one for you. So you've got 56% of companies have been breached by a third because of a third party access. They don't even a lot of these companies don't even know how many third parties are accessing their systems. They've never vetted the third parties. So you've got all of these and, and you mentioned a second ago this threat surface. I mean you're you're not paying attention. You don't know how large your threat surface is. You don't know the the different areas you need to look at and and a criminal has nothing but time. You know, they don't have all the money you do. But they've got a lot of time to sit there and look at that landscape. And that's what they're going to do. And typically, it, it doesn't take a lot of time because the, the failures are failures that we've known about or it's been bitched about for years that we've not done anything about. Definitely. So I want to switch gears a bit and talk about Frank Abagnale. Right. So it came out, I think, <laughs> earlier this year that all of his stories were completely made up. How does somebody like that go so long has Hollywood movie made on his story. No, how did nobody catch that? Well, it turns, have you read the book yet or not? Not yet. Okay. Alan Logan wrote the book. It's called the greatest hoax. And it turns out that over the years that Frank Abagnale, it was called out. So he was in San Francisco he was giving these, these presentations at the chamber of commerce and everything else. A couple of reporters, they started to check out his story. And it came up as not true. They published articles about it. What did Frank do? Frank moved from San Francisco to Oklahoma to get away from the stories. Back then, we didn't have the internet. So those stories didn't follow him. And he continued on. And, and the problem is, is that there's a, uh, there's a film called The Man Who Shot Liberty Balance. It's Jimmy Stewart and John Wayne. And in the film, a reporter looks at uh, Jimmy Stewart at the end of the movie, and he says, uh, when the legend becomes fact, you print the legend. Frank Abagnale's story is that. So what happens is, is Frank continues to tell these stories. After a while, people stop even trying to check them. They're like, oh, because the story's really good. He supposedly he passed the bar exam in Louisiana. Let's be honest. For those who don't know, the bar exam in Louisiana is one of the hardest bar exams in the United States to pass. If you can pass that bar, you can pass the California bar. It's that difficult to pass these that that specific bar. He supposedly he passed the bar. Supposedly he worked as a pediatrician. Supposedly he was an airline pilot. Well, the stories are so great that no one really, they're like, oh, it's got to be true. Let's just write the story. We, let's say he did this, he did this, he did this. They don't worry about that because the story is so good. Until finally this director named Steven Spielberg decides he's going to make the movie on the book that Abagnale supposedly wrote. And I don't think Abagnale wrote the 
but he, he makes Catch Me If You Can. At that point, Frank Abagnale becomes a legend. It's past the truth. It's now a legend that he becomes. And when the legend becomes fact, you print the legend. So now it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether he told a lie or not, because that story's already been told. And we see this now. Alan Logan, he, that book is 400 pages. And Alan Logan lays it all out that, hey, every single thing the guy ever said is a lie and nobody cares. That's the scary thing about it. Now, when you think about it, now, Frank Abagnale, and I, 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 I was actually talking to a couple of uh, security guys about this. Frank Abagnale did a lot of good. He, come, he owns like 11 check security patents for, for security on, on physical checks. He did do some check fraud. Absolutely did. He did do prison time. Absolutely did that as well. So he did some good. But at the same time, Frank Abagnale did a lot of damage in the security industry because people take him as being this authority. And the problem is, is he's not. He's not. He, he knows some of the stuff. If you're talking about check fraud, he knows check fraud. Does he know internet security and, and cybercrime? No, he does not. Not at all. He knows what someone tells him to say, and that's about it. And that's why, if, if you go to see Frank Abagnale in a presentation, Frank Abagnale does not take any off-the-cuff questions. He, he doesn't answer questions. He doesn't do anything else like that. And it's because he's scared of being called out or having a question asked that he doesn't know the answer to. So my feelings on that, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm conflicted, man. I'm conflicted because I always thought that, uh, I mean, he kind of paved the way for what I do now. You know, he, he, uh, he started speaking and I do the same thing today. So in, the, in one sense, he paved the way for what I'm doing. In another sense, he caused a lot of damage to not only me, but other criminals who are trying to turn their lives around. It's very difficult for a felon to get a job. Very difficult. And when you've got a felon like, like Abagnale, that it comes out that he's lied about everything, then that colors every other felon that's trying to make a living in the security industry. Because all of a sudden everyone's thinking, well, Abagnale lied. What, what makes sure that this guy's not lying? So I, it, I'm, like I said, I'm conflicted about it. I think that at the end of the day, Everyone needs to do their due diligence. You know, if they're if you're hiring me, you know, make sure I know what the hell I'm talking about. If you're hiring anybody, make sure they're trustworthy. Do you have references? Is there a a path where you can somehow trace that the the potential person that you're hiring, that felon, can be trusted in your environment? That doesn't mean you don't bring them in, but that does mean that when you bring them in, don't let them touch anything until you know you can trust them. You know, with me today, even today, I've been doing this. I, I've been, I, I'm highly trusted. I'm well respected these days, but there's not a company on the planet that's going to let me touch their system. And it's understandable why. I come in and I talk, I consult, but I don't touch. Don't touch, don't leave them alone. You know, that's the thing. I'm sorry to, uh, to, to ramble on about that, but the Frank Abagnale stuff, it's. Uh, I assume that definitely hits, hits home. It does. It does. Awesome. All right, Brett, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All right, that's it for this week. Thanks for listening and leaving reviews. If you have any comments or questions, I'd love to hear from you. I'm at Jamus on Twitter or drop me an email at podcast at breachsense.io. And if you're part of a security team that needs visibility into your employees, customers, or third-party suppliers' breach credentials before criminals exploit them, head on over to breachsense.io to apply for a free seven-day trial. Thanks for listening, and I'll be back to your earbuds next Thursday morning.